Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH virtual event space. You are tuned in to the best camera settings for wildlife, nature, and landscape on your Sony cameras, hosted by Sony. And for that, I'd like to welcome Sony Ambassador Mahesh Thapa. Mahesh, how's it going? Great, great. Thanks for having me back, guys. Uh, Derek, always a pleasure to, to talk with you for a few minutes before we get the show rolling, catch know, up on I, stuff. I know. I always look forward to chopping it up. How's everything been up in the uh, Pacific Northwest? It's great. Fall was amazing this year. Uh, you know, up north, we've got these golden larches. They're one of the only two evergreens that uh, are deciduous. So they drop their needles uh, uh, at the end of fall. But before they do, they get this beautiful, bright yellow scent of kind of oranges color to them. And it's nothing like it in the world. Been out with some my nice hiking, capturing fall colors. It's been great. So that's always my favorite season. Unfortunately, it's just too short, and winter's coming around the corner. <laughs> I know. Well, well, then don't come to New York. You'll be severely underwhelmed <laughs> when everything's still green or it's it's on the sidewalk already. So, but look, <laughs> we're talking nature and and fall colors. This is a perfect time of year to be diving into what you're diving into because everybody's always asking what settings, where should I start, how do I get the pictures that I want to get. So. I'm going to turn it over to you, Mahesh, and remind everybody, if you guys do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments section. If you're joining us right here in Zoom, we'll drop it in the Q&A. Mahesh, I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you again, Sony, BNH, for always being so gracious uh, in inviting me. Uh, each time I think, oh, that's the last one I'm going to do, just royally screw that one up. They go, ah, you know, that wasn't so bad. We'll have you one more time. So again... Thank you very much for having me. Uh, today's talk is, it's, you know, it's not going to be very sexy. It's going to be a little dry, unfortunately, but we'll try to make it as interesting and as educational as possible. Uh, and I want you to think about the things I'm talking about. I don't want it to be sort of formulaic or cookie cutter, like, oh, Mahesh Stapa says you should put this as your value, so that's what I'm going to do. This is sort of like a starting place uh, for you to get 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 going on on specific types of photography. Again, everything I'm saying is my opinion. This is what's worked for me over the last 10, 15, 20 years. I've sort of iterated it uh, based on hiking that I do, based on wildlife photography that I do. And so so I feel like I do have a little bit uh, of experience behind what I what I have to share. So so if you have any questions, as Derek said, please don't hesitate to uh, put them in the chat and we'll get to that. Uh, I'm doing a little something different today. I have my little switcher set up for the first time. And I'm going to go to the camera settings view and hopefully that shows up with a little picture of me of me on the side. And let me go back to my face and show you what camera I'm using. I'm using this. This is the Sony A7R5. So it does have uh, the new uh, menu system on here. It's just, uh, it's not blue. I just have a skin on it. <laughs> uh, don't, don't get fooled. You can't buy a blue version of this camera. Um, but basically, you know, we're going to look at uh, the settings up here. Uh, the one, two, three, what I like to use for that. Um, some basic uh, camera settings that I think one that should be global that you should uh, pretty much always set and then tweaking them uh, to your type of photography, specifically landscape, nature, wildlife, and so forth. So let's go back to that uh, to that view. When you first press the menu button, this is the new menu system. So if you have the older menu system uh, for some of the older Sony cameras, this will look vastly different, but the concepts are gonna be the same. So you just have to find where some of these items are located. Uh, but I'm gonna first talk about the setting I make on every camera, uh, a Sony camera, as soon as I get it, uh, you know, whether I, I'm planning to do wildlife or, or nature or what have you. And I'm going to go through it. The You've got at the very beginning, this is sort of the my menu setting. This is where you can put your favorite uh, items. Uh, I have enough customization on my buttons uh, and in my and dials that I don't I have very few things in the my menu. Uh, the, the less I have to dive into the menu system, uh, the more things I've already have uh, programmed to buttons and dials, the better I like it. So I try to keep this as minimal as I can, but you may be a person that likes the my menu system, but for going the my, my menu, the, the, the home button or the home main sort of gives you an idea, a global idea of what you have selected. Uh, you can, and you can go to the main and you can see these little things that you can 
change, but that's just an overview. Okay, so let's let's go let's dive into the the main settings. First of all, the image quality, and most modern cameras you can choose a JPEG or HEIF or H E I F. H E I F is quote unquote better in the sense that it takes up less space and it's probably less compression artifact. But JPEG is more universal um, and uh, more programs, uh, particularly if you have uh, older software, are able to use JPEGs, uh, not so much with HEIF. And, uh, but you have a modern system, you may want to try HEIF, realizing that if you take that image somewhere else or if you try to email that uh, image to somebody in that format, they may not be able to, uh, to view it or open it. So for that reason, because I'm sharing a lot of uh, images on social media, sending it to... Uh, uh, friends, publishers, I typically keep it on the JPEG setting. Now, that's not to say that I shoot JPEG exclusively. I typically, on the image quality setting, I typically shoot in RAW or RAW plus JPEG. So I encourage you to do that, uh, particularly if you're doing things like nature and landscape, not so much wildlife or sports, because you're not going to have so many images that it's going to be a burdensome for you to go through them on your computer. Maybe if you're doing sports or wildlife uh, or NASCAR, when you have a, a bunch of burst images, then maybe uh, you may want to switch over to JPEG if you're happy with uh, doing minimal editing. But if you want to get the maximum out of your image, I really encourage you to shoot raw or raw plus JPEG. You know, I mean, years ago, I, I came up with a saying. I, I used to tell people on this. I said, you know, shoot in RAW because memory is cheap, but memories are priceless. And to that, I still believe that to this day because meaning that the RAW is so malleable. There's so many things you can adjust after the fact. White balance, contrast, saturation, color space, even. You can you can choose. You don't have to um, be in the sRGB or Adobe RGB. You can choose any color sp your space you want after the fact. Dynamic range is so much better. Uh, so if you can, keep it in the RAW or RAW plus JPEG. Uh, if you expect to do minimal editing on some of these images, but if you have this one great image and you want to tweak it a little bit more, it's nice to have that backup of the RAW if you shoot RAW and RAW versus JPEG. So that's what I typically keep it. And if you look here on the on the media settings, this camera has two slots. So I'm sort of a a little persnickety about 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 losing information. So I typically write the same information to both slots, both both uh, cards. So I typically shoot raw or raw like JPEG to both slots in case one gets corrupted or one gets damaged uh, or I lose a card. God forbid, uh, I have one backup. Uh, but this this your mileage may vary. You may you may want additional room because your card isn't very big, the memory size, and which may you may do sequential where it fills one slot and then it uh, goes to the next slot, uh, or you may want to have video on one slot and, and images on the other. But if you want sort of the ultimate, well, not the ultimate, but could, they could both fail at the same time, but as 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 much safety as possible, uh, try to put it's the same information on both cards. Let me go back here. Uh, I'm going to concentrate mainly on camera settings, but there, if there is a question later on, uh, if we have more time and you're interested in what some of my video settings I do, I'm happy to discuss that too. But for now, I'm going to I'm going to keep it to the uh, uh, to the camera. So again, I'm not going to go through every single menu items, only the ones that I think are important and the ones that I have initially universally set. So this is an important one, and it's called long exposure noise reduction, and by default, it's left on. So what it does is if you have taken an image of maybe more than one second or two seconds, depending on the camera, depending on the manufacturer, it takes a second image of the same duration. And it's with uh, with basically the shutter down, or it's like having a lens cap in front of your lens. It simulates that, takes another image, and it subtracts that black image, if you will, from your initial long exposure imaging with the theory that uh, the amount of noise that's generated is, is similar on both exposures. And when you subtract one from the other, you're helping get rid of some of these long exposure noise. So that used to be 
really, really great uh, in the older days. This is sort of still left over from 10, 15, 20 years ago when you had when you really needed this because the sensor technology wasn't great. Uh, long exposures generated a lot of heat, and each time you uh, generated heat, it created more sensor noise. It's I don't think it's necessary anymore. The sensors have gotten so good, the cooling systems have gotten so good that all it does is it prolongs the time before we can take the next shot. You know, let's see to a 30 second exposure. You don't wanna to have to wait a minute to take another image, right? And I've done experiments with this. I've done uh, shots where I, where, I, where I just take a regular uh, long exposure shot and one, and one without noise reduction, one with uh, long exposure noise reduction. And there really is no appreciable difference, even four, five, six minutes. And those are long exposures. The only caveat is, is if you do, or if you plan to do multiple long exposure shots, one right after the other, let's say you want to do five two minute exposures, uh, then the sensor will get hot enough to create additional noise, right? But, you know, again, it's minimally more even at, at that at that stage. So as a general rule, I typically turn off this long exposure noise reduction uh, for, for, for any type of photography that I'm doing. However, the high ISO noise reduction, uh, I do keep it on place, which if you shoot raw, it doesn't really matter because uh, you could do that after the fact. But if you shoot raw plus JPEG, I think the algorithms even more recently and the more recent cameras from Sony have gotten so good that it does a great job of reducing noise in your JPEG without making it look mushy or without sacrificing fine detail like feathers um, and edges of flowers and the stamen and things like that. So I think it is worth uh, putting the high ISO noise reduction on. I typically leave it at normal. Try that out. Uh, low, you know, it's, 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 it's minimal. That may be more to your taste, but I sort of like it at the normal value. So high ISO noise reduction, I do keep that on, but I turn off the long exposure noise reduction. And if you shoot raw, the color space doesn't really matter, okay? Uh, you could choose uh, uh, sRGB or Adobe RGB. I just keep it at sRGB again because I could change that color space later on in post-processing depending on what my eventual output is. Most of the time, if you're just doing social media shares or even if you're printing images, a lot of printing places uh, now they're able to accept Adobe RGB, but there are a lot of printing places that still only accept sRGB, and you'll get much truer colors to what you're seeing on your screen uh, if you use uh, sRGB sort of throughout. It's best to do profiling and, and matching, but if you had to pick one crawl profile, even though it's it's more restrictive, the gamut is not as high, uh, it's uh, easier color space to work with is the sRGB. But if you shoot raw, it doesn't matter. You can choose the color space after the fact. Uh, lens compensation, again, I'm not going to worry about that. It doesn't really matter if you're shooting raw. Uh, this is, uh, again, I'm not going to worry about this part. Uh, this is not so important. So this camera memory uh, setting. So you could have a set of parameters on your camera, your ISO, your aperture, uh, you know, white balance, what have you, and save it uh, in these memory settings. Uh, on this particular camera, on the dial itself, uh, if you if you look on the dial itself, it has these like one, two, and three, and that's where you can assign those values. Some cameras have less, some cameras have more, uh, but that's the part that I find uh, very, very valuable. So you could and there, there are two philosophies, basically, on how you can use these dials. And I, I leave it to you to decide how you want to do it. I'll give you one scenario. I'm often hiking, and I have the longest lens that I can carry comfortably with me on my on my, on my, on my, on my shoulder. Uh, and it's typically like a 100 to 400 or 70 to, 70 to 300. And um, that's because if I run across wildlife, or if I see a fleeting moment, it's usually something I want to capture with a telephoto lens. It's not something wide angle that I want to capture. So I have a big sort of lens with me and that's what I use to take a picture. Uh, and for those situations, I uh, 
I typically want a very fast shutter speed because it's probably something that's moving. Uh, I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of noise to make sure that I don't get a blurry image. I want to get the widest aperture possible, you know, so I sort of have, have it at the widest aperture to carry, to cap, capture as much light as possible. So one scenario is, let's say I'm walking and I see a bird. So if I see a bird, I want a high shutter speed. I want a shallow depth of field. And I want uh, the IS, auto ISO such that the ISO is able to maintain those other two parameters. So I may set that as is my number one. My second scenario, may, and, and it's, let's say it's the bird that's flying and the shutter speed's gonna be very high. So maybe one four thousandth of a second. So that will be my custom button number one. Now let's say I'm walking and then I see an animal, but the animal is just kind of meandering or walking or a bird that's perched. I don't need a shutter speed that high, right? So I maybe go down to one five hundredth of a second with the same other parameters. So I set that to number two. And, and number three is just maybe a portrait. You know, I want to take a picture of uh, uh, somebody walking by in the street that's fleeting. And so I don't maybe the one one hundredth of a second, one two fiftieth of a second. So I have that number three. So that's one philosophy is that you want to set those parameters that you can set right away because you don't want to miss that fleeting moment, whether it's a flying bird, uh, a moving animal uh, or a street shot. The other philosophy is that you set those buttons to the values you use most often. So let's say you're predominantly a landscape photographer. So you know you always shoot at f8. You have image stabilization turned off. Uh, you know you you always have your ISO set to 100, uh, and and, and uh, you have your uh, noise reduction however you want it. Uh, then you set that to that particular C1. Realizing that you know you don't you don't need that that those dials for quick moving stuff. You just we want to be able to wherever you are, whatever settings you may have set, quickly set it to number one or number two, and you're back at your useful landscape mode. So again, so it's philosophy. It's it's what do you like, or you maybe want a combination. You know, maybe you want one dial for landscape with those uh, with those very fixed parameters, and other ones for birds. So I sort of leave it to you, but that's how I use these memories. Okay, so <clears throat> a drive mode again. It depends on what you like to what you like to shoot. Uh, for landscapes, I keep it at at single shooting because I don't need a burst. I can. It's on a tripod. I can. I can look at the scene. I can decide what I need. But if you are doing move birds in flight, moving animals, moving kids, then you may want to do <clears throat> uh, continuous burst, whether it's low, medium, or high, depending on the subject you're shooting. Uh, every so often, I want to do a self-portrait or a group portrait when I put it on a timer and I go and get in front of the camera and I want to take a picture with me in it, then I put it on a timer. What's great about the Sony is you can put it on two seconds, five seconds, or 10 seconds. Uh, and you can even have, <clears throat> have a burst where you go, go in and it takes maybe <clears throat> three images or five images, uh, uh, you know, 10 seconds later. So that's great. So, but typically, since I'm mainly uh, doing hiking with my camera on, I put it on a mid burst where it takes, a, you know, five, six, seven frames per second so I can capture that fleeting moment. Uh, but for landscapes, you may want to keep it on just a single shot. I typically don't work with bracket settings. The bracket settings is, uh, well, let's, the, this is focus bracketing. So if you wanna if you wanna take an image and you want a, a maximum depth of field, this camera will actually take images at various focal lengths. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, very various focal points uh, on the image uh, uh, and focus at different points, and you can later combine them. Uh, for macro photography, that's a real boon. Uh, I don't typically shoot a multi-shot, but if you want a high megapixel, super high megapixel image, this is the way to do it. Uh, 60 megapixels for me is good enough that I don't really have to go uh, and worry about that. So let me talk to you a little bit about the silent shutter mode. It's great when you want to be in a, in a quiet environment, but it's not a panacea. It's not... Uh, it does. It comes with its detractions. 
So a lot of people may not realize this, but in the silent shutter mode, the sensor generates a little bit more, a little bit more noise than in the mechanical shutter mode. Uh, and the more you use it, the more you realize. Uh, sometimes silent shutter mode can catch flickering lights. It can have, have a pattern. So if you don't need silent shutter mode, it's best to turn it off and use mechanical shutter. Uh, that little bit of slap uh, is is just fine. You know, you've got you've got a modern camera that can handle the slap of the shutter very well. You've got uh, uh, first curtain. See if I can show that shutter type, mechanical shutter. You've got this e, e front curtain. I live, typically leave that on so that minimizes any shake from the mechanical shutter moving. But if you have to be in a in a very very silent environment, uh, then then you do want to keep the silent uh, silent uh, on. I typically turn it off because I'm never in a situation where I have to be that quiet. But maybe in a church, your wedding photographer, or maybe you're shooting golf uh, and you don't want to disturb the swing of the of the golfer, then maybe you want to turn the silent uh, shutter on. But I typically keep this uh, at the mechanical shutter because there is some sacrifice that you're making for the silent shutter mode. Uh, okay, so image stabilization. For most people, it's one of those things you can turn it on and forget about it. But it doesn't, it's not great for all situations, okay? So let's say, you're on a tripod and you're doing a, a super long exposure. The steady shot or the image stabilization with the Sony or something else, it may actually fight against the quality of image. The, the, the camera will think, oh, you know what? It'll perceive motion or shake when there really isn't any. And it'll try to compensate for that. But by trying to compensate for it, it's actually creating uh, more instability and you may get blurry images. So for longer exposure images, on a tripod, I typically turn off steady shot. However, you know, for, for images that are less than one or two seconds, it's okay to leave it on, particularly if you're in an, a windy environment. So even though you may be on a tripod, the wind can cause some micro vibrations, micro movements. Maybe it's hitting the lens. If, the lens, if you have a big lens, if you have a hood on, the hood increases the surface area for the wind to hit. That can cause some minimal movement. If you're taking pictures of the waterfall and your tripod is in the water uh, and there's a stream and the stream is is, is flowing and, and little eddies are hitting the bottom of your tripod. These are things you may not think about, but these are things that can actually cause some micro vibrations in the one, two second range. For that, even on a tripod, steady shot is, is wonderful. It does a great job of getting rid of those things. So conceptually, uh, think about the situation you're in and see if you really need steady shot on or not. Most people are not shooting exposures handheld, you know, more than two seconds or so. So it's probably okay to leave it on. But for the specialized conditions, when it's a very long exposures, think about turning it off because it'll actually work against you. Um, oops. Okay. Uh, shooting display. So for me. When I do a lot of landscape photography, I like having the grid display on, not necessarily for the rule of thirds as far as composition, but mainly for getting that perceived horizon straight. And what do I mean by perceived horizon? Even when you have the level on on your camera, one, it's not 100% precise. Two, it may the camera may say you're perfectly level, but sometimes the the water line or the tree line makes it look like <clears throat> the image is a little tilted, even though it isn't. Gravity wise, it isn't. I love having that line because then I can align the line exactly what I think should be the straight line in the horizon, what I think should be the straight line in the tree, and use that as as my frame of reference as opposed to relying purely on. Um, on the bubble level or purely on the level of the camera because yes technically it may be perfectly aligned with respect to the world around us but because of the scene the water line the tree line may not give the perception of a perfectly horizontal or vertical image and that's where these grid lines i think really help to really align it 
along the line of your uh, of your grid. So that's a little pro tip uh, for people. You know, you'll go home. You go. Wow, I, I thought my horizon was perfectly straight when I took that image, and it probably was based on the level. Uh, but it, but it's just that's just the perception of the image itself. Depending on the scene you're capturing, uh, may not give that uh, give that final result that you're looking for. Uh, if you're doing a lot of long exposure photography beyond 30 seconds or so, you'll be you'll become intimately familiar with the bulb setting. And in most cameras, for the bulb setting, you actually have to hold the shutter down for how much of a longer you're going to take a picture for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and let it go, or have some kind of a electronic uh, shutter release or uh, uh, or or a mechanical shutter release that holds the camera's shutter open for that time. What's unique to some of the Sony cameras is this bulb timer setting. And what I love about this is that you can decide beforehand how long you want the shutter to stay open, 60 seconds, two minutes, 10 minutes. And all you have to do is press the shutter once at the beginning. And then after a set amount of time, the exposure will end, right? That's such a cool feature, I think, that often isn't present in other cameras where you have to menu dive and do intervalometers and things like that. But I love the fact that um, in the more modern Sony cameras, it includes this bulb timer. And I use that a lot, particularly for my long exposure photography. Uh, as far as the ISO limit range, I, I typically keep, the, keep this at uh, 100. And, and people ask, well, why don't you keep it at 50 or 64 or 80, uh, which will give you a cleaner image? Well, remember that depending on your camera, it has a manufactured recommended ISO level, whether it's low ISO of 100, some, some cameras it's 200, uh, some cameras it's 64. I typically try not to go below that because the images may look cleaner, but it's sacrificing dynamic range to do that. And let me explain what I mean. So if I put the minimum ISO down, for example, say ISO 50, the camera, what it's, so what does that do? That means that you're allowed to expose for double the time uh, that you could for ISO 100. So you may think, oh, you know, I wanna take a picture of that waterfall. Uh, if I make it down to ISO 50, I can get two second exposure versus ISO 100, I can only get one second exposure. So don't be lulled by that by that feeling because what's actually happening is setting this camera to ISO 50, it's just taking the same image overexposed by one stop and then darkening it in, in post-processing. So what you've done is you could do the same thing at ISO 100 uh, and and just uh, overexpose it by one stop and 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 darken it in post-processing. Uh, you lose the dynamic range in the very bright areas because you've overexposed it, but you have less noise in the shadows because you've allowed more photons to capture the dark areas. So I say stay within the limits of what the ISO range is because everything else is, is just software tweaks that you can do yourself uh, um, if you want. So that's my pro tip for those uh, ISO limit ranges. And exposure compensation, I don't know why it said minus one, <laughs> usually it's at zero. So metering, the modern camera has gotten so good at metering that I usually just keep it at multi-metering mode. Every so often, every so often you may wanna go to center weighted or spot. For example, let's say you're taking, oh, Siri. <laughs> uh, let's say you're uh, taking a picture of a person who's backlit. If you use a multi-weighted center metering, it's gonna look at the entire scene and it may be fooled by the backlighting. And so the image is going to be dark. The person is going to be dark, even though the scene may be fine. For that, you can switch to the center weighted or with a standard spot metering. With the caveat that, uh, that you have this face uh, multi-metering, if you have that turned on, 
then you don't have to worry about any of that center weighted or standard weighted because typically where that where the spot metering and the center weighted metering really is problematic is for portraits of people but what i love about this system is that you could keep it in the multi weighted metering and just say face priority so the camera will say, I recognize a face, and it's great. This is, it's, it's great at recognizing faces. I recognize a face. I know the backlight is on and it's telling me to underexpose the image. But because the face is detected, I'm going to expose for the face, even though I'm in multimetering. In the, in the old days, you couldn't do that. You'd actually have to change the metering mode to the center or the center weighted or, or spot metering. So I love the fact that you can do that. Furthermore, you are also able to do this focus point link. So now you don't have to worry about faces. So let's say you're capturing a picture of a bird that's moving around. It goes from the bright sky down to some dark foliage area, right? So the metering system can get very, very fooled if it's trying to use the multimetering because when it's, the sky is very bright, it's going to underexpose the image to compensate for that, and your bird is going to be very dark. And so the bird is going through uh, this wooded area where it's kind of dark, and it's going to overexpose, and the bird is going to be very, very uh, overexposed because the bird is kind of lighter in color versus the background. But if you link that metering to the, the point where you're focusing, so if the focus point is, is on the bird, no matter if it's in the sky or if it's in the in the dark area, it's gonna expose for the bird. So, which is typically what you want anyway. Uh, so, so I love doing that. So not every camera does this, but most, well, more of the modern Sony cameras allow you to have this focus point linked metering, which I think is, is an amazing thing. So uh, auto exposure with shutter. I typically have that auto, uh, which means that the exposure is is based is is linked on your shutter. Now the focus isn't linked to my shutter. I'll, I'll tell you why later. But the exposure value is linked to the shutter. Okay. White balance. I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, focus mode. Most of the time, I have it set on continuous autofocus. Uh, oh, I have this thing on manual. Let me put it on autofocus. Sorry. So the continuous autofocus system, particularly on the Sony, is so good that I can just leave it and forget it. If things are moving back and forth, if you're moving back and forth, if you have it on continuous autofocus, it's going to compensate for that and give you a sharp image virtual every time. Before, what I used to do was have it on single autofocus, focus, take a picture, focus, take a picture, focus, recompose, take a picture. Now with continuous autofocus, I can just hold the autofocus button down, recompose how I want. It'll track the subject I'm looking for, and I take the picture it comes out fine every single time. So that's one of the things I truly think you can just leave it and forget it no matter what scenario you're, you're using. So here's one thing that I, that, I, that I turn off. And this is a personal preference, but I think the more you use cameras like this, the more you're going to appreciate this. Autofocus with shutter. I turn, pretty much turn that off because I typically autofocus with the back, back button. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So on my camera, there's a button here. You can see it. Right here, AF on. So I focus with this button here, right? I don't use my shutter button uh, at all. The shutter button is just to release the shutter. And, and, and this is why. If I'm tracking a bird, uh, I can use the back button to focus and then keep it there because as soon as I press the shutter button, it's not gonna try to refocus it. So also let's say 
I am taking a picture of somebody. I can use the back button autofocus, hold it down, recompose, and when I'm ready, take a picture with my shutter. If I if I press the shutter button again, and I don't have back focus, or I, and I, or I haven't uncoupled autofocus from my shutter release, it'll try to focus again on something that I may not want focused. So I so this is a technique called back button focus, and I think a lot of photographers really like this. Try it out. The only downside that I see is if you give your camera to somebody to take a picture, uh, they won't. A lot of times they won't know to use the back button to autofocus. They'll just take a picture and press the shutter button thinking that's going to focus for you and take a picture. But remember, the focus is uncoupled from that shutter. So whatever it was focused the last time is the picture it'll take. You know, it'll be instantaneous. That shutter will be released instantaneous. That's because it's not focusing at all. So, you know, for casual situations, you know, you know, when you have a smartphone or whatever, then it probably isn't a great idea to uncouple the focus from the shutter. But for more professional uses, I really like to uncouple that for my, my shutter button. And if you have questions about that use scenarios, you know, I'm happy to go over that uh, uh, in more detail. Okay, right. Subject recognition is another great feature of the Sony cameras because it's so good, so good at detecting various types of subjects. Uh, so for example, human birds, uh, animal birds, insects, train, whatever. Um, when I'm out hiking, I typically keep it at animal slash bird because that's what I am seeing sometimes that I don't want to miss. Uh, if I'm out with my friends or at home with my son, I keep it on human. And you could set and you can put that on one of those custom dials, however you like it. So you can have one button for animal human, uh, one dial for uh, for animal bird, one dial for human. So that's another great use of the um, of the dial system so you can quickly go from one to the other without having to menu dive if you will uh another thing i love to do is red left uh right eye selection because oftentimes you want the eye that's closest to the camera on focus and not the one back but if you always want a particular eye in focus you can choose that but i leave this on auto uh so it just picks the eye that's closest uh to that uh, to that focus point. Um, okay. Focus assist. If you do a lot of manual focusing, particularly for macro type of photography, I really like this uh, auto magnifier and manual focus because what happens is, let me take my uh, my thing off and I'm going to hopefully, okay. So as soon as I turn my manual focus dial, Oh, sorry, that's the, let me turn the manual focus. Here's an autofocus. As soon as I turn the manual focus, you see that? It zooms up right to the area. And then I can manual focus exactly where I want to. And what I love is it just stays there until I'm ready to shoot. And then you can take a picture. So I love putting that as, as a, a zoom function. And But there's another function there that I don't like so much. And that is the, uh, focus uh, magnifier. Yeah, that's good. That's what I want. I'm sorry, just focus magnifier time. Yeah, put this to no limit, meaning that if you put a time limit on this, if you're manually focusing and, you're, and you take a break and you want to double check, it may automatically go out of the manual focus and into the regular uh, unzoomed view and you have to mess with the focusing dial again and to get a magnified view. So just keep it on no limit so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I think maybe the other one. Oh, peaking, right. So peaking display, I, I haven't found a camera system that I like the peaking display in. So basically what it does is in manual focus, it looks for areas that it thinks is in focus and it outlines it in any color that you've chosen, white, red, green, depending on the options. Uh, and you could have the sensitivity of that being high, a lower, but I find that a lot more distracting. And I find that it's not as good as picking up the fine details, fine edges as my eyes are, particularly when you have a high resolution electronic viewfinder, like some of these Sony cameras, your eyes, I think are much better 
and, and I wear glasses, <laughs> so my vision is is super great. But even then, my my vision and my uh, is much better in these high resolution images to pick out the manual focus position versus doing any of these aids like focus peaking. Uh, if you have experience, otherwise, I'd, I'd love to know. But uh, I usually turn that off. So the play, I'm not gonna worry about so much. Uh, and this is just, uh, you know, Bluetooth settings, streaming settings that has really no effect on your on your on how you take your images. Uh, and and the other touch operations, not so uh, not so great, not not so important. Right. So I've touched on what I think are the very important segments that you should think about. Again, you have to decide yourself what type of photography you want to do, what type of photographer you are, and set those values after giving it some thought. Because the type of image you take, uh, the type of scenarios you find yourself in is going to make a, make, make a big difference on what you set those values. A lot of other things that I haven't talked about that are, are important, but I think, you know, what I've talked about is universal to pretty much... Um, most camera systems, not just to Sony, that you want to think about uh, carefully before you set them. All right, Derek, I think I'm going to leave it open for a few questions if people have it. We're going to open it up for questions, you guys. If you do have any questions, feel free to get them in. You broke that down, and I think for a long time, Sony has made changes to the, the menu system, but that was always something that people called out was the menu system and how in depth and hard it, hard it was to navigate for certain things. Um, and look, when you're out there shooting, it can be, it can be frustrating when you're trying to it's dig awesome, through a yeah. menu system to look for something you can't find it, but they have made uh made great strides. So we're going to leave it open to questions. What, what was always the thing for you that uh, is most important when it comes to menu and settings and function buttons and all that. I, everybody has their own way of setting their camera and getting everything right. I'm a big function button person. I have a couple, two, three function buttons that I have set and I, I live and die by them in the exposure compensation dial. What about you? What's your, what, what kind of photographer are you in the way of settings and, and function buttons and, and menus? I'm a big believer of the, the custom dial. Uh, you know, because I'm a predominantly a landscape photographer, and for that, I don't need any of these fancy settings. All I care about is being able to set my aperture. I keep my ISO as low as I can, and then I let the camera decide what my shutter speed should be based on the depth of field that I want. So for that, I shoot raw, so I don't need any anything for that. But what I need it for is if I'm walking around or I'm hiking, uh, and I have this big lens on me, and all of a sudden I see an animal go by or a bird go by. I know I can quickly go to custom function one or you know custom dial one, and no matter what settings I've had it, you know, ten second timer or a you know uh, ISO one hundred, it'll immediately go to one two thousandth of a second, f four aperture, uh, you know auto ISO with tracking, and, and it'll get the image. You know, it, I, I won't miss that fleeting moment. So, and that's and equally important is having another function set in what 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 it's not so rigorous. So, for example, a, a bird in flight, I may have one four thousandth of a second, but that typically means the ISO is going to be like, you know, thirty two hundred, sixty four hundred, very noisy. I have one that's a little bit more conservative. That's maybe one five hundredth of a second, where you know it's a uh, thing that's moving but it's not flying flying super fast it's just sort of walking and so i still want to freeze the action right but i don't need such a high shutter speed and it'll, and it'll allow the camera to choose a more conservative iso value like iso 600 or iso 800 or it's not so noisy so without me having to think about it the custom uh, dials that allow me to achieve that is what i think has been a game changer for me if that makes sense. No, oh, no, totally. It's like it's like having you have your own situational presets. I do the same thing. It's yeah. like you know. Well, okay. Yeah, initially, when I said this is so great, I'm going to set my C1 to my landscape setting where I'm always shooting typically f8, f11, ISO 100. You know, five seconds shutter speed. That's fine, but I can do that in the field and take my time doing that. 
Yeah. That doesn't require a custom value, right? Right. If the if a bird is moving in front of you, the animal is coming. That's what I want to be able to switch a dial and not have to set every other parameter. Yeah, exactly. It's it's that prioritizing the yeah. situations where it's like, okay, I don't need a custom dial for this because in this situation, got all the time in the world, I can it's, take my time. Yeah, got all, yeah. all the time in the world. Yeah. Yeah, totally. We did have a question come in from Sean joining us on Vimeo. It says, just received his new A1 today. Congrats on that, Sean. I think you're going to love it. Are there any specific Alpha 1 settings that you would recommend that you were not able to do on the A7R5? No. Okay, so so I have the A1, and the A1 is built around high ISO performance. Okay, so its ability to shoot at very high ISO is unparalleled in the Sony ecosystem. I don't know how it's going to do compared to the A93, but it's built around high ISO. Uh, so it's really built for fast shooting. It's not, I mean, I'm a Sony guy and it's not so great at low ISO. I mean, it's just known, right? Because it's it, it they've, they've chosen to focus their, uh, their energies, their research into the high ISO. So if you are shooting lower ISO uh, images, just realize that it's going to take a little bit more care. It has slightly less dynamic range than you expect. So uh, if you're taking landscapes with an A1, it's certainly doable, certainly good, but you may need to control the light a little better. You may need filters. You may need to bracket your images. So as far as the speed, you've got a great camera. But for landscapes, you you maybe want to be a little bit more careful. That's a great point, Mahesh, that, that you bring up. And especially with the alpha line of cameras, certain alpha cameras are, they're all, they're all great across the board. Let's, let's just throw that out there first. They're, they're going to do their job across the board and take great images, videos, whatever you want, but there are slight nuances. And this is the same, no matter what camera brand you're shooting, there's going to be a model that's going to be better for people who are taking video more seriously. There's right. going to be a model that is for the megapixel crowd and a model that, okay, this has two processors because it's for the people who are going to be shooting, you know, content that is going to be needing to be fat, uh, processed faster. So it's really like anything else in life. There's no correct model. It's which one is right for you and for your needs. Yeah. You know, just, I, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, I, I, I want to straight this again. Try to not to shoot at ISO values outside the manufacturer's recommendation because it's just software tweaks. You're not getting any higher quality. I mean, there's nothing that you couldn't do yourself that the camera is doing for those things. Like people always think, oh, you know, why are you shooting at ISO 100? It says you can shoot ISO 50. Don't you want to do that so you can have a smoother images? Well, there's a sacrifice. It's just taking a high ISO 100 image, overexposing it, and then darkening it up in post-processing. You know, so... A lot of people don't realize that about what's actually happening with the lower ISO values outside the manufacturer's recommendation. Yeah. It's like going back into the days of digital zoom when they first started incorporating digital zoom yeah. and everyone's like, oh my God, 20 times zoom. It's like, no, <laughs> we're, we're just cropping it. <laughs> we're cropping it. <laughs> oh, sneaky, sneaky tech companies. Did have a, another question come in from YouTube. What would you say are the best settings for shooting wildlife at night? Any night wildlife tips for those possums and Yeah, get a very, raccoons? very fast lens. <laughs> <laughs> Carry around a no, fun light. All, yeah, all, all seriousness, uh, all joking aside. Uh, for night photography, so that A1 is, is great because, like I said, uh, you want a camera that is geared towards better high ISO performance than it is for low ISO performance, right? Uh, but nothing beats good glass, right? I People ask me, I tell people, well, a lot of people say, equipment doesn't matter. The great photographer will find a way to make great images. And to a certain point, it's true for landscapes, for, you know, you control the light. Yeah. But for wildlife and action, you know, you get for what you pay. I mean, you pay that $13,000 for the F4 600 millimeter lens. It's worth it, right? Uh, you know, that high eyes, so how, no matter how good that performance is, it's not going to beat that, your your lens ability to open up to f4 you know so but if you can't do something like that then choose a camera that is known to be very good high iso performance camera that's built the sensors built around high iso performance oftentimes that also means you're sacrificing low iso performance 
Yeah, great great point again. And and really, I think people have to figure out what matters most to them, to what they photograph. People like right. me aren't going to be bothered by noise. I'll, right. I'll shoot ISO 12,800 regularly out in the street, but that's the street. Those images yeah. might be able to handle that degraded quality. I mean, even be better because Add of it. it. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. But it, it all depends on, you know, what use case you have and your own particular, there's people that just don't like noise. They have right. a ton of wonderful software out there. I know a lot of people use like the Topaz software for right. uh, denoising and it works great for some people. Some people don't like it. Some people yeah. don't care about noise and some people, uh, you know, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. You know, it's funny. 20 years there, there are these, giants in the field rightfully slow, slow they had these edicts and they you know but what i love about today is that everybody is an artist and everybody's opinion is just as valid everybody's tastes are just you know some people use oh i don't like that because it's so oversaturated but you know what there's a market for that there's a group of people who love that you know and it's i love the fact that everybody can share and not feel like that oh it's not as good as so-and-so's image or, or it's not Right. Totally. Totally. And and it makes it all these different cameras that, that the brands are coming out with now, it makes it so that there's something for everybody. There's something yeah. where no matter what your genre is or what matters to you, there's going to be something that's going to fit. It might not be the same as the next person, but there's something out there. There's an offering. Well, totally. Mahesh, tons of great information as always. Always good to have you on here. You bring a, a positive vibe to the show. So thank you for that. And uh, to all of you out there watching, thank you for your questions. Thank you for viewing. As always, of course, Sony, thank you for hosting this event as well as many others that they do support us with. That's it. That's all we got for now. Another rendition of the b virtual event space in the books. Thanks, guys. Time. See Thanks, you tomorrow. Mahesh. Bye.